This is CHSR 97.9 FM here in Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada. This is Python's Paradise, your film and music show. And this is your host, Greg Gilbert, a.k.a. the Python Hyena. And folks, I am celebrating the 35th anniversary of probably my, probably my favorite Canadian film, Class of 1984. And I've had so many people from that film on here. But I'm going to have a return guest today. He's not my first return guest from the film, but I'm going to have him on anyway because it's just a delight to talk to him. I have the guy who played Drugstore, Stefan Arngrim, on here today. And he's being joined by a colleague of his, Claire Deming, who is a ballet dancer. So while we're going to be celebrating the 35th anniversary of Class of 1984, Claire, I'm going to have you interject a little bit here and there about uh, your work as a ballet dancer as well. <laughs> Hi, Greg. Thank hey, Greg. You for that. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, we're hoping to keep that storm at bay. <laughs> that's, what, yeah, that's how I'm doing yeah, right yeah, now. A thunderstorm hovering over you, which will be hovering over us in here in New York probably within the next 48 hours. So. Yeah. Oh well. <laughs> no, uh, no. I first come to, to, of course, you know from the our previous interview. Of course, I I know you mainly from playing drugstore in class of nineteen eighty four, and I'm going to tell you, um, despite all the problems, the back backstory problems with that film, it's I think it's still my favorite Canadian film, and uh, I've had a, a lot of good connections from that film. I've had Lisa Langlois on here. Yeah. Uh, her manager is still uh, her manager. Mike still sends uh, guests yep. my way, and uh, so I'm still connected there. I've had Mary Lynn Ross on twice. Um, yeah. I've had you on twice, and I had Gord Lewis from Teenage Head on in, uh, back in I, April. Uh, yeah, I got your note on that. I got that email on that. That's great, man. Yeah, that that was a lot of fun actually because. Uh, Mark Lester wasn't entirely sure. Well, he wasn't really, really like at home in 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 the idea in the punk scene. <laughs> no. And uh, and we were in Toronto, so so uh, we basically Neil Clifford and I decided to go out and find the good clubs and find some good people and everything. And and I, and I, I forget who it was who came back and said. Uh, you got to hire teenage head. You got to get teenage head. And I forget who it was. It was either Neil, Keith, or me, or maybe it was Lisa. I don't know. But anyway, I don't think it was Lisa. <laughs> yeah, I forget. It was one of us though. And, and that whole club scene was all very sort of impromptu, and you know, yeah, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Well, you know, I, I was talking to Lisa recently, and 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 she actually ran recently uh, into uh, Perry King, and had even talked to Neil Clifford, and um, and then I just I'm in the middle of dealing with some stuff with Tim Van Patten over at HBO, and and it's interesting because a lot of a lot of us um, apparently I just learned this. We're, weren't real, <laughs> weren't real happy with like being sort of associated with the film for a long time. I know Neil didn't want to talk about it forever, but apparently Lisa tells me they're getting more receptive to the idea and want to get together. So who knows? Maybe you can have like Neil Clifford's a great guy. He's right now he's a sculptor in Toronto. You got to have him on the show for sure if he'll do it. Okay, well here's my thing about that. I've messaged Perry King twice now. Right. And having her back on his web page. And there comes a point where I'm like, you know what, how long can I keep knocking at somebody's door? Yeah. Same yeah, yeah. no, absolutely. No, I just say Lisa Lisa said she ran into him recently and he was kind of like, yeah, well, you know, cuz somebody had asked us if we'd do some kind of reunion thing this year because of the film and all of that and screening it. That I don't know if that's been put together or not, but apparently um you know, uh, under the right circumstances, uh, uh, all those guys will show up. I, I had no idea everybody else was having such a lousy time on that film until Lisa told me. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, I do understand. I mean, that, that happens sometimes. Sometimes movies are just really difficult. Now, Timothy Van Patten, I can't find contact information for him at all, so... 
but he's at HBO. He's been directing. He started directing with The Sopranos, and then uh, he's been directing Boardwalk Empire as well as producing it, and uh, and uh, a number of projects over there at HBO Pictures uh, and Television. And he's in England right now. And uh, when he gets back, we've got a. I have a project I want to. We're going to talk about and. Yeah, he 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 uh, he moved back behind the camera, which actually was appropriate for Tim. I don't think he really ever was too crazy about being an actor, but he's a great director. And Neil Clifford, based mm-hmm. on what you told me, mm-hmm. I you told me that I should reach out to him anyway. Mm-hmm. So I did. I found his web page. He's not the first uh, actor I've encountered that's into sculpturing either. Yeah, I know. Uh, huh? A lot of them. I know Day Young from Rock and Roll High School is into sculpturing as well. Yep. But um, I reached out to Neil Clifford, and uh, he responded, and he um, he thanked me for uh, for reaching out, but he said he respectfully declines. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, and and and, um, and and you know, and it may be that way. I don't know. I haven't spoken to any of them. I just I know Lisa and I talked a couple of times, and there was some there were some things that were presented to us, like a screening of the film at NYU or something like that, that I think made uh, everybody feel a little more comfortable with it. <laughs> maybe <laughs> but, maybe but they should knows? they who should knows? come here. Has anybody celebrated that film like I no. have? I bet not. I, Not to my knowledge. No, exactly. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know anything. I think we should have a big party at Central Tech High School, frankly. But <laughs> Oh, I wish I could get there. <laughs> You're talking to somebody who never travels. And judging from the That's airport right. situations right now, I don't know if I want to get on a plane. <laughs> no, I know, huh? Well, I've, I've just recently I've promoted... Well, we'll have to do a road trip. I we'll have to do a Class of 84 road trip. and uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> we'll, we'll come up and grab you on the way. I was I, I was promoting the Texas Frightmare, and one of them, I've had like four of my guests that were at that, and one of them had reported that she had an embarrassing situation at the airport where the sensors went off and she got strip searched and they found nothing. But I'm, I'm like, you know what? I can't deal with that. Yeah. <laughs> but it's yeah. It's gotten very invasive. It's gotten very invasive, and I. Yeah. I don't want to get arrested for retaliating. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, because I don't. I've been. It's funny because I'm basically the Michael J. Fox of class of 1984. I went through 12 years of school being bullied mm-hmm. until uh, people found out that I have a love for snakes and, uh, ooh, kept their distance. But. Um, uh. I didn't have you knifed or anything, did I? No. No. <laughs> no, no, not anything like that. Oh, good. <laughs> I wonder what Michael J. Fox is doing now. Has he done anything since Class of 1984? <laughs> <laughs> He's running, actually, a, a fabulous, fabulous foundation for uh, for Parkinson's disease. Which, yeah. Uh, uh, my dad passed from, and uh, and uh, he's, he's, yeah, he's done some great work. He's a, he's a terrific guy. He wasn't Michael J. Fox when we made that movie. He was just Michael Fox. And then when he came to L.A. and joined SAG, there was already a Michael J. Fox. That's a, you know, there was a Michael J. Fox who was probably 97 years old or something like that. You know, but if you have a name in the union and it precedes you, you can't use that name. You've got to change it. Oh, gee. So he had to become, he had to use his middle initial. I'm not even sure that's really his middle initial, at any rate. <laughs> that's why he's Michael J. now. And he's not, if you look at the credits of Class of 84, he's just Michael Fox. Michael Fox with that really bad hairdo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No yeah. wonder he got picked on. Oh, my God. <laughs> Claire, I was just wondering if I could get a little bit of your background. I know you've done some modeling and whatnot, you know. And uh, I was just wondering, get mm-hmm. a little bit of your background, get to know you a little bit. Oh, all right. Well, I started out as a dancer. Okay. I was a trained dancer and kind of morphed my way into all those areas and genres of, of dance, contemporary ballet, and the ever-changing tap. And uh, I kind of segued into musical theater, which is where I still am. I've done many straight plays, and... Shakespearean productions, and I stayed away from film 
I've stayed away from television. And I just, I love the theater, everything about the theater. So basically that's where I, and I still am, I'm living in New York and, and auditioning. <laughs> and has one of the most extraordinary voices I've ever heard. Yeah. Well, I pay him to say that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I love the pics that I'm seeing online, you know. Like, oh, uh, the, the ballet shots? Yeah, they, they, they're yeah. very elegant, you know, and I, I had to comment on a lot mm-hmm. of them, you know, because, you know, when I see something that's done well and done stylishly and done beautifully, i got to give person their props, and uh, you've done a great job. Well, thank you very much. Yes. That I was l- long ago and far away, but um, we got our memories. So there you go. <laughs> yeah, the camera loves her. So do I. There you go. I heard Stefan say on the, the last interview how he come to meet you. I was mm-hmm. wondering if I could share your version of it. Oh, my version. Yes. Um, okay. It's, you have to go back now, the wavy lines. It's 1980. I would have been eight years old that year. Well, you know, I should just hang up the phone right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's, so it's 1980. I'm, I believe I'm about 24 and... Stefan is 25, and I was in the park and having some photography done. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I was, we were kind of wrapping everything up, and then all of a sudden, you know how you have your peripheral vision, and out of the corner of my eye, I saw a, a person to my, to my right, and I looked over there, and right by the sunlight, there was a gentleman standing there, very tall, lanky, thin. Keith Knight? This, I'm sorry? Keith Knight? <laughs> no, not at all. I didn't know who it was. He was a tall, lanky gentleman, and he was just staring. And he had a, um, I guess I could say a leather jacket on, I, which I can see it now. And he was carrying a bag of some sort, and he was just staring. But he was looking down. He wasn't meeting my eyes. And I kind of looked at him, and he looked at it. And as his eyes went up, our eyes met for a second. And he kind of gave me one of those half smiles. I smiled at him. Neither one of us did anything more than that, and he started to walk away. And I just said to, and I had never done this before, and I said to the people I was with, I said, I'm, hold on a second, I'll be right back. And I started to walk after him. And him being, you know, 6'1 with legs that go from here to Toronto, yeah. he, he was way ahead of me. And as I was walking, I kind of like started to call out to him. He didn't hear me. And he kept going, and it was one of those little Cinderella moments. I had had a pair of sandals on, and the, the heel just kind of, like, crashed off. And it just, so I stopped to pick up the heel, and he was gone. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, finally, one thing led to another, and we kept passing each other over the years. Well, there you go. That's the Reader's Digest version. You have to wait for the book for the next one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The, 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 the only point I would like to make is is that so, she she was there doing a photo shoot. And she was like just slipping off her toe shoes and under her <laughs> sandals and stuff like that. And just to run into like a ballerina uh-huh. in the park was kind of stunning. And um, I, you know, I mean, was, my mom took me to see Nureyev and Fontaine in Romeo and Juliet when I was like seven years old. So. So I have, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have kind of a ballerina fixation to begin with. So this was kind of stunning. <laughs> I take I take it Black Swan's one of your favorite movies, then. Huh? Well, I have to tell you, I was very uh, impressed with what Natalie Portman did with that role, uh, and and also, you know, um, the way it was depicted was a little rougher, I guess, yeah. than what I was encountered in in any kind of you know dance. Okay. But, um, uh, it's a favorite. It's not the red shoes, <laughs> but it's a favorite. I've had a ballet dancer on here before. Um, mm-hmm. I reached out to Antonia Franceschi okay. uh, two years ago. She was in the movie Fame. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah, and she, she was, was the ballerina in Fame. Yep. Yeah, she mm-hmm. she's she's still gorgeous too. I'm still. Oh con- well. Yeah, I'm still co- I'm connected with her on Facebook and. Uh, mm-hmm. And um, I didn't know this until she sent me her information, but she was a backup dancer in Greece. And it, mm-hmm. I, I, didn't sure. even, I didn't even have to watch Greece. Uh, I didn't even have to stick it in my Blu-ray player to know which dancer she was because there was only one backup mm-hmm. dancer I found attractive. <laughs> yeah, there you go. And she confirmed it. It was her. 
Except well, in Greece, she had she had dark hair, and in fame, she had blonde. She was blonde. See, we do that. Yeah. Yeah, we do that. But I was I was happy to have her on, and uh, she still she still mm-hmm. does ballet still stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You, you that connect is a great thing about ballerinas, I'll tell you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 how are you getting the impression? Ballet is like pouring to Stefan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, question, Claire. Did you, did, um, yeah, did you see Class of 1984? I, I, I own Class of 1984, yes. Do you mean did, back in the day did I see it? Either I way. I don't have any recollection of seeing that movie back in the day. Do you know that? Not any recollection. I started seeing these, his movies when we started getting together. But Do you have a favorite of his movies? Oh, I have to say Fear No Evil. Okay. You know what? I've never seen Fear No Evil. Oh, I've got well. to see that. And I know he did that before Class mm-hmm. of 1984. Mm-hmm. He actually was in town, right, Stefan, promoting it or right after? Yeah. Which is when I first met right. you? Yeah. In the park? Right. Tell me yeah, a little that's... bit about that film, Stefan. Fear No Evil. Yeah. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. That was a strange little movie. Um, uh, a very clever guy, young guy. I, I was, again, I was like 24, and I don't think Frank was, Frank Lelogia, that's what I'm talking about. I don't think he was much older than I was. And uh, he'd done some, uh, he's an actor, and he'd done some stuff, and he managed to put together this. <laughs> wonderfully cryptic little horror film and um and and uh um kind of squeezed it into a you know avco embassy in the early 80s invested a lot of money in in things like the howling and and scanners and fear no evil were their big mm-hmm. i've know, done like, interviews from howling releases. and scanners as well with who? I did a couple interviews from the howling and i interviewed Stephen lack from uh, right. scanners yeah yeah, I know Stephen and uh, Mike Ironside is an old friend, and and uh, so yeah, so so uh, I went. I just oh, I got a phone call from uh, uh, from my uh, manager saying, "Listen, your agent has a call for you uh, up at uh, Crossroads of the World, which is this place up on Sun- uh, Hollywood Boulevard and or Sunset Boulevard in, in Hollywood, and uh, they, these people want to see you right away. They're doing this picture." And I was totally unprepared, and um, I didn't even have. Hello. Yeah. We there. Oh yeah. Okay, good. Mm-hmm. Uh, I didn't even have any clean clothes. <laughs> I hadn't done my laundry, and the only thing I had was I had a pair of black tuxedo pants, and a, and a black coat, and a black shirt, and some boots. And it was about a hundred degrees. <laughs> so I went. <laughs> I went up for this. And uh, I remember I talked to Guy Garner, who is the editor and uh, one of the editors, and and it was in the production office at the time. And he stopped and looked out the window as I was crossing the parking lot to try and find their office. And and he called uh, the co-producer over and and Frank over and said, "Look at look look who's coming across the parking lot. And it's Guy. He's not even sweating." And um, so. <laughs> <laughs> so it was it was a lot of fun actually, and so I wound up doing the movie, and we went up to uh, Rochester, New York, uh, which it was kind of a hometown affair for Frank and Charlie, his cousin, because they were both from Rochester. So we went there, and then we went to Alexandria Bay on the St. Lawrence Seaway, and we used the old Bolt Castle up there, which was great. And uh, yeah, it was um, it was a lot of fun. It was a, a lot of fun. It's a very very strange little movie, and uh, but. Um, but I had fun doing it, <laughs> and that's really all I ever care about. So, you know, you know he usually doesn't have a very happy ending in these movies, does he? <sighs> no, they like to blow me up and burn me and stuff like that. Yeah, it's, 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 it's like that. You know, it's like they like putting prosthetic makeup on me, and you know, it's just, yeah, it's just the way it is. There's no happily ever after with Stefan's movies. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know Stephen Lack, huh? Yeah, yeah, we've met. Yeah, well, we're not like you know best buddies or anything like that. But yeah, sure, we run into each other. I had him on for the 35th anniversary of Scanners last year, and Terrific. I was quite surprised because uh, we have a new a New Brunswick connection. His wife is from Moncton. 
Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, so he's been he's been to Fredericton, you know, and uh, yeah. I'm still connected with him. He, I see his artwork and stuff on uh, Facebook and whatnot, and uh, I thought it was interesting. Somebody was in this famous Cronenberg film had a connection yep. here to New Brunswick. It's I, I guarantee you, Donald Trump don't know where we are here. <laughs> no, yeah, nor does he care. Uh, uh, what, what, what's that's his another phone what's call. His name? Larry, Larry, um, Brand. Yeah, Larry Brandt has been working on a picture with uh, Stephen for a while. I think it's more or less kind of an interesting kind of documentary thing with Stephen and a lot of projects he was involved in and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, he's an interesting guy. You you still connected with Jenny Wright? Oh yeah, I see her every once in a while. Or I run into her. Or, you know, I, I actually haven't seen her in several months. Um, uh, but she's, I think, living uh, on Long Island somewhere right mm-hmm. now. And uh, but yeah, yeah, we 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 occasionally talk. She's just been really busy with a, a bunch of stuff, so we haven't talked on the phone or anything. I, you know what? I was so happy to have her on here, and mm-hmm. um, I've come to discover on YouTube right now. Oh, the 48 interviews I did last year, hers has mm-hmm. the most views. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. Yeah, I'll tell you a funny story about that. I've known Jenny for a long time, and, 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 and some years ago when uh, we were both in L.A., she was, uh, she was terrified. She didn't want to have anything to do with anything, and, and, and she had been asked to come to this award thing at the Directors Guild with, you know, Bill Paxton and... And you know a bunch bunch of people she knew from pictures and everything, and she felt so bad, and she felt oh I've let everybody down and all this kind of stuff, and who's interested in me and all this kind of terrible. And I says Jenny, 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 you gotta you gotta get out of the house, see these people, and you know what? I go to these conventions and stuff. Everybody loves you. Everybody would love to see you. You know. You know. So it took a while, but eventually it wasn't just me, but you know several other people. We kind of got her out of the house and got her out of and of course she found out immediately that it was absolutely true. She's just you know people adore her. So yeah, <laughs> I'm uh, not surprised. I'm gonna to try to get her on again too. Uh, you should. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm gonna reach out to her again, see if I can get her on and talk about this book that she wants to do and whatnot. Yep. But. Yeah, I I was of course Pink Floyd the Wall celebrating 35th anniversary this year, so it's a good That's thing right. have her come on. But um, yeah, I I took me a while to get hold of her, but when I got her attention, it's like uh, it's interesting because uh, she's got the most views from last year as of right mm-hmm. now. So mm-hmm. there's people interested in her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She tends to be very reluctant, but she's got a, a great story to tell. I can't wait for the book. I, I know it's <laughs> going to be terrific. I've made some donations to that book. So, yeah. Yep. <laughs> well worth it. Yeah, well. I'm sure. Yeah. Yep, but um, anyway, um, of course, Class of 1984 celebrating 35 years as well. Clara, I wondered, do you have a favorite scene from that movie? <laughs> the first thing is you said that. I was going to say I know the one I don't like. <laughs> um, What's the one you don't like? Well, the... <laughs> Well, his demise, of course. Oh, you mean when he turns into barbecue? Yeah, he's a little on a shish kebab there. <laughs> yeah. Um, he has actually, you have to ask him about this. He has a great story about the gentleman that um, that stood in for him for that. My favorite is probably, um, how can I put this? <laughs> when Roddy has the gun on him. <laughs> The look on his face, the tremors on his... I know that expression so well. You know, the bottom lip is quivering, and his, he actually is, looks vulnerable there for the first time in the whole movie. And I know that expression. Actually, <laughs> uh, he looks he looks vulnerable all through the movie. Did you see the oh, fight sure. scene? I would have taken him out and got Lisa to replace him. He was doing that badly. <laughs> I know, huh? <laughs> He's so evil in this movie. You know, about 17 years after that scene in that classroom with Roddy, which was a lot of fun because I've known Roddy McDowell since I was a kid when I first went out to L.A., and uh, and it's just a really terrific guy. We all, That was the first chance we had to work together and last. Um, but uh, 17 years after making that film, I did another film with Mark Lester up in Vancouver. Misbegotten. Misbegotten yeah. with Kevin Dillon. 
Yeah. And uh, and Nick Mancuso and a bunch of. Oh, I had Nick Mancuso on last uh, year. Nick's great. Nick's an old friend. He's uh, he's a terrific guy. Yeah. Uh, and and in this movie, Misbegotten, there's a sequence when uh, Kevin. Um, has to uh, stick a 45 in my face. <laughs> and, and, and we were shooting a scene down on a beach at night under the Lionsgate Bridge in Vancouver. Mm-hmm. And Marcus is, is sitting you know, off camera somewhere. And, and we finish this scene, and I hear cut, and then I hear this laughter, this chuckling off camera. I look over, and it's Mark. And I say, wow, well, it is so funny. And he says, you know, 17 years ago, I had Roddy McDowell stick a 45 in your face, and you made exactly the same faces and noises that you just did just now. <laughs> and I said, well, what can I tell you? That's what happens when you stick a gun in my face. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, there you go. I haven't seen Misbegotten. It's but a funny movie. It's actually very funny. There's a lot of, re- it's, I mean, it's very dark. It's, it's, a, it's a very, very dark comedy but but it, it is it's quite funny and kevin is very good in it i liked kevin in the entourage movie yeah, yeah, yeah. he's a great actor i you know both him you know both kevin and matt oh yes absolutely both of them but um no i i have not had mark lester on here um i know that um Nick Mancuso had suggested I get in touch with him, and so did uh, Paul Lynch, who I had on here to talk about prom night, and uh, right. and I uh, had great interviews with them. But I've inter- I've, I've messaged Mark Lester a couple of times and haven't mm-hmm. heard back. Mm-hmm. But I'm going to tell you, I was listening to the commentary track on Class of 1984, <laughs> and um, yeah. I got to say, um, I I understand where a person has a long career. And they might misplace a little bit of information, but I was very unimpressed with the commentary track because um, Mark Lester seemed to not know the names of. Uh, no. <laughs> he did not know who Neil Clifford was or Lisa Lang was. Never mentioned them once by name, and only once mentioned Keith Knight by name. He knew who you and T- Timothy Van Patten was, and uh, you know the other regulars yeah, well, in the had movie. To pay extra for us. <laughs> <laughs> oh my frig! I, I mean, there was a scene with Mary Lynn Ross, and uh, the guy that was doing the commentary with Mark was saying, uh, "What can you tell me about this actor?" And there was almost a little bit of a, a dead silence or whatnot. And I'm sitting here thinking, I could tell you a little bit about. It. I've interviewed her twice. Come on, guys. <laughs> yeah, like they were married. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. You know, Mark is a. Uh, uh, you know. I, um, what can I say? Mark Mark's a character, and 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 he's a real. I mean, he's a he's a successful guerrilla filmmaker. I mean, he will pretty much do whatever he thinks is necessary to get a shot, and this is not always appreciated <laughs> by by act, cast and crew, and uh, and and from my understanding. Although it didn't seem to affect me, and then that's a little bit of a problem because I was a SAG contract actor out of Los Angeles, as was Tim. Okay. And uh, apparently, my understanding is is that the actors who were hired under Canadian contracts, including Lisa and Neil, were not treated very well. Yeah, I've heard and, that. Uh, and that apparently is very common. I've run into it before, and uh, I think it's ridiculous, and, and, and it just has no place in, in this business or, or any other. And, uh, but, but it does happen there, you know, and, um, you know, it's a pay scale thing. And, uh, um, and uh, I, I, I think you might have a difficult time, if you do get a hold of Mark, getting him in the same room with... Uh, with most of the cast. <laughs> <laughs> so read between the lines there, Greg. <laughs> yeah, well, I heard, yeah. yeah. No, I... I, I had I've, no I've, idea about this until Lisa told me uh, not long ago. She said, you know, we really, uh, he, we, we, did, we were not happy on that. And she said, you, you didn't have any problem because you stood up everybody and i said i did <laughs> I, had no idea. I, I must have been more into drugstore than i thought um, <laughs> yeah because drugstore didn't stand up for anybody 
Yeah, I was busy. I don't know what anyone else was mm-hmm. doing. <laughs> yeah, dr- drugstore didn't stand up to anybody. Yeah. <laughs> Mm-hmm. No, but I, I kind of noticed in the film, like, you wimped out on the fight scene. And I even oh, yeah. noticed last time I was watching the film, and uh, you chase Michael J. Fox and uh, Aaron Noble into that oh, yeah. alley. Yep. You you go right after Aaron Noble. I'm like, you're going yep. after the woman. What's wrong with you? Because <laughs> I'm a cowardly <laughs> monster. Right. Uh, you know, and actually that fight thing was funny because um, uh, originally – um, uh, none, nobody on our side was getting hit or going down. And the way that it was getting directed sort of by the stunt coordinators and everything, who were really great guys, by the way, like Terry Leonard, terrific coordinator. But, but it was starting to look funny. I mean, you know, there was four of us, and, and there's like, like six guys, and, and, and uh, nobody's going down. And finally I said, this is crazy i said you know what and i turned to terry i said i i would like to take a hit and go down and that'll give and and neil said well that gives me a chance to come over and save him mm-hmm. which i thought was a kind of a good character development thing that fallon and drugstore were sort of tight and uh and and so that was it that was that was our choice to do it that way originally i mean if we if it had been gone the way that we were shooting it you know it would have been uh i think uh Rather surreal. <laughs> well, it's kind of like that scene in A Clockwork Orange at the beginning of that where they run yeah. into mm-hmm. Billy Boy and his gang. Mm-hmm. That's and, right. And there's like one or two more in Billy Boy's gang and, and mm-hmm. Alex and his droogs clean house. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yep. But, uh, no. I'm getting that Greg's a fan of the movie. What do I, you think, Stefan? <laughs> Oh, yeah, I think so. <laughs> oh, I've known Class of 1984 for a long time. In fact, uh-huh. I'm, in a, I'm in a way in a protest because uh, the last few years we've had the National Canadian Film Day. Yeah. And they would always play clips of so many movies. And there were some great movie clips like Bon Cop, Bad Cop, which just had a sequel. Yeah. Yep, that was terrific, you know, and they yep. play clips from like Meatballs and whatnot. Sure. But I never saw any clips of Class of 1984. And I'm like, come oh. on. Well, you know, it, it is really kind of con- counterculture in a lot of ways. And, you know, the original... It's a platform it, jungle, right? Y- yeah. I mean, it is... Well, I think it was... That's my opinion. My opinion is is that it's, it's an updated blackboard jungle. The original screenplay was pretty loose and was called Gorilla High, actually. And um, it's Perry. Perry came up with the name Class 84. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so, you know, uh, but, you know, we had a lot of problems. I mean, the original cut of that film couldn't pass the MPAA board here. It got an X rating and couldn't have that. So Mark had to go back and cut, I don't know what, at least like 10 minutes out of the movie just to, you know, get it, get an R. And uh, I don't know what happened to that footage. Well, I'd like to see that. <laughs> what, what footage was cut? Uh, some of the uh, some of the uh, uh, scene with Mary Lynn in her bedroom where she's attacked. Oh yeah, yeah. That that got a little more nasty and graphic and violent. I go to a, and unfortunately yeah. there happened to be a pregnant woman on the MPA board oh. when they screened that film, <laughs> and that just really didn't go over big. Like so. were, there, were there any s- whole scenes cut or anything? No. No, just pieces of sequences and 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 uh, and ends of sequences where things might have gotten just a little more out of control. And there's a few lines of dialogue that were looped from the original. Yeah, I heard that you said last time uh, um, Keith Knight made a uh, what was it, Elmer Fudd. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, we actually we, we we programmed that whole thing as as uh, Warner Brothers cartoons uh, in real life, because I, I I said we were joking about it, and I said what could be more terrifying than Daffy Duck as a real person, or or you know I mean it's a horror, and um, so that's who I was. I was uh, that's actually drugstore is largely based on Daffy Duck. Daffy that's why Duck. he's kind of cowardly and sneaky. <laughs> <laughs> really? I mean, that's, I'm not kidding. Yeah. He's not kidding. He really feels the same. <laughs> so what was Timothy Van Patten, Yosemite Sam? Uh, he was, no, he was, uh, I forget. Um, we sort of, we made him bugs for a while. And, uh, 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, it just sort of turned around. But I, I, I had originally, the thing was, is that, you know, there's a the thing about playing, like, really villainous, horrible characters. you got to make a decision. You're either going to try and find a way to, like, you know, find something redeemable or decent about this character and, and play that, you know, and because, you know, like, it's not black and white, you know, like that. The most uh, genuinely evil people... Somewhere inside, they've rationalized that they're doing a wonderful thing. So, so, so you know, you gotta, you gotta sort of figure that. Or, or you go the other way and you say, you know what? <laughs> there, is, there is no chance that there's anything redeemable about this guy, drugstore, or you know, they've run into a few, and there shouldn't be. So, what do you do? You can't really base that on a human being because that's too, that's two dimensional, and human beings aren't two dimensional. So. I picked Daffy Duck. <laughs> what was Le- what was what was Lisa? I forget. I think Lisa was a. I don't know. Maybe Bugs Bunny and Drag. I forget. <laughs> oh, Lola Bunny. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know. I forget what we did. We talked about all kinds of weird stuff. I mean, it was just you know. But I remember thinking, and the only way this is going to work is to try and somehow envision Daffy Duck as an actual living, breathing human being. And how how really horrific that would be. <laughs> Neil Clifford Neil Clifford with Speedy Gonzalez. <laughs> I, for, I, forget, I forget I forget who was who, but we all sort of fooled around with you know identities and I mean we did have a lot of fun. I mean there was a lot of laughing on that movie because it was just there was a lot of stuff that was just goofy, and um, so. What was the? Uh, I have a question for you. What was the? animated cartoon with the little guy that threw the bricks. I think he was a mouse. What's that? Remember that? Was it Crazy Cat? Oh, yeah, Crazy Cat. And, <laughs> he and, threw uh, someone through the bricks? Yeah, what was that? That was pretty maniacal. Yeah, he was pretty Ignatz. maniacal. Ignatz, he was pretty maniacal. Yeah. There you go. But Ignatz had, had, was, was a tough guy. Uh, um, drugstore was. Well, uh, Greg's right, Drugstore No, was, I meant for Tim Van Patten. Oh, that would have been Van a good Patton, one for him, Ignatz right? Character. Ignatz. Okay. Well, drugstore well, did have. I don't see any redeeming qualities in drugstore. Good. I see one. <laughs> I see really? one. You see one. Which one? One. One time, <laughs> because when um. He's gone. When uh, poor uh, uh, Mary Lynn Ross is passed yeah. out on the bed, mm-hmm. Neil Clifford is getting ready to deck her with that chain, and you were the one that oh. hauled him okay. off. That would have been your one redeemable moment. Oh, yeah. But you see, I told you that scene got cut. You don't know what happened next. <laughs> well, oh, tell really? Us, tell us. <laughs> what happened oh, next? I, I, I thought you just grabbed her and pulled her off the bed. Huh? I thought you guys just grabbed her and pulled her off the bed. You mean something happened yeah. after that? Oh, yeah. No, it was a rather, it was a rather graphic, long, and, and, and oh. very violent kind of, you know, oh. rape scene, but without any, you know, no, no nudity or anything. It was remarkable. It was just all just in the way it was shot. But it was pretty over the top, and, uh, and, and it got very silly at points, and I think that that was the major objection to it. And they were probably right, because... You know, you, you sometimes when you're doing stuff like that, you get insulated, and and things like that seem like really funny. You start giggling, and you just think, well, pff, this is too silly. But you know, in the context of a movie, it could be really offensive. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so you know, these things happen. Uh, we know all about that because Hobo with a shotgun was shot up here in Clyde. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> with a shotgun. That's a great title, isn't it? I don't know that movie. Rutger oh, Howard. It was shot shotgun? in no- shot in Halifax, Nova Scotia, I believe. <laughs> That's right. a great title. Yeah, Rutger Howard. They had him here. That's right. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I-, I was sent an email or something about possibility being an extra in that and i'm like i don't want to drive four hours to nova scotia to be an extra (laughs) (laughs) especially what since i'm chances of me seeing myself are slim to none you know well yeah they did have that extra work you 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 wait and you wait and you wait and you spend all day on the set because i've done a few of those things and you you think you you know you're waiting all day and and then when the movie comes out, you get maybe an eyeball or something you get to see of yourself. It's not worth it. 
They did have one of the trailer park boys in Hobo, though. There you go. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He met a very nasty demise. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I like that show. We're proud of that here in Canada. Oh, well, absolutely. Are you kidding? We Those should... guys, brilliant. Well, he's going to have to see Fear No Evil if he wants I gotta to. See, see I've got to see Fear No Evil. We don't have video yeah. stores up here, and my TV... How about YouTube? You it might be on YouTube. Oh, I'll have to look on YouTube. I think, yeah, it is, I think you can get the whole movie on YouTube. Yeah, they're cracking down on that on YouTube right now. I know they are. I know. They get this... But, you know, the thing about Fear No Evil is it's kind of an orphan movie. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. I think there's, like, some, there's like an original print in a, in a vault in Chicago somewhere, and the minute anyone opens that door, they owe a whole bunch of people money. So they're not going to do it. <laughs> so Fear No Evil's not on Blu-ray? Uh, I don't think so. Oh wow! The uh, the the DVD deal was difficult enough. A- Anchor Bay did that, and I'm not quite sure how we, that even happened because, uh, you know, there was. Um, let's put it this way: there's some money owed on the movie, and uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's one of those. Yeah, it happened. You know, it, it, it's it's funny too because. Um, you know, with uh, YouTube being the way it is, of course, uh, me, I'm set up right now. I just watch my Blu-ray movies on my TV. Sure. I don't even have it set up even for Netflix. I've had people yeah, say, right. you got to get Netflix. got to get Netflix, you know. But yeah. I just stick a disc in the machine and watch my movies, yep. you know. That's yep. pretty much how I'm set up. And I've got Class of 1984, and occasionally I'll watch stuff on uh, on YouTube if I can find it, you know. And yeah. You know, they, they they say that's downloading or downloading. And I'm like, look, if it's on YouTube and I can see it. <laughs> well, as long as you're not downloading a copy of it, and I don't think that that's pretty difficult to do if you're watching it on YouTube. Exactly. That's, that's a different thing that they put it there. Yeah, they, that's what it's there they for. They uploaded mm-hmm. it. Yeah. You yeah. didn't. Yeah. <laughs> but that, uh, safe. let's go, safe. go back to that scene in the alleyway. I thought it was funny when you went after Aaron and uh, p- poor uh, poor Michael J. Fox. Um, he gets taken by uh, Keith Knight, and it looks, just looks like a bear mauling a mauling a puppy. You know? <laughs> yeah. But I'm kind of like, you know what? Maybe maybe you did take the tougher one because, quite frankly, I don't think Michael J. Fox could beat Aaron in a fight. <laughs> uh, probably not. <laughs> Aaron. I don't know. All I remember about that scene was. Is is that we were in this this alley, this mouth of this alley, and then we had to go down, and we were trying to figure out how to block it and all of that. And and Mark, I kept hearing him call to me, and then I looked up, and he was up on a roof, like six floors up on the roof, looking down over this alley with a viewfinder, and saying, Seven, seven, go left, and then stop at the wall, and then, and meanwhile. Uh, Bert Dunk, who was the uh, cinematographer, director of photography, he already has the camera set up down at the other end of the alley. He's already lighting the shot. And he yells out at me, he goes, Seven, come this way. <laughs> and then Mark yells, Seven, walk back over here. And then Bert goes, Seven, move the <laughs> And finally I turned around to Bert and I went, Bert, what do I do? Mark, you're calling me up here? Mark's up on the roof calling me down here. And Bert Dunk goes, oh, fuck him. He's just the director. Oh. I've got the camera here. <laughs> okay, there's that three-second delay we need. <laughs> oh, it's okay. This is, when this goes on in the Internet, who cares? Okay, Jaffe curses. Actually, you know of, what? The joy of filmmaking. <laughs> I had um, Le- Leanne Curtis on from 16 Candles. And, oh, yeah. and she says to me, before we record, I'm just telling you, I have no filter, and I said yeah. I don't mm-hmm. care, because <laughs> mm-hmm. I had Zach Ward on here, and he asked if I if he could swear, and I I I, and I told him he shouldn't, but then looking back, when it goes on the internet, who cares? Well, it, you, know, you know, I feel like it's words like anything else. I mean, as long as I'm not saying anything that I think is going to offend anybody, and I'm you know, in this particular case, I'm telling a story, and that's what happened, and I don't think that's a problem, but you know, cut it if it is. Is that the sirens coming after drugstore? 
What's that? Is that the police sirens coming after drugstore? Um, yeah, that's yeah, right. You yeah. know, this is a typical day in, in New York. <laughs> but no, uh, I, I'm Timing hoping. Timing was great, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but if yeah, I get over here now for the if it, for the swearing thing, I'm gonna get a big <laughs> ticket. Mm-hmm. There you go. Look, like, like if I have Zach Ward back on here, I'm gonna let him just cut loose, you know, because I want yeah, to be go. as authentic as possible, you know. But <laughs> you know, I I'm not big on censorship. I understand uh, there's a place for it, but well, yeah. um, I'm not a um, a family of four guy. I, I, I don't like uh, going to having people try to shield people so that uh, kids can watch something, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I'm not, I'm not a big fan of uh, people trying to tell me what I can and cannot watch on my television. Mm-hmm. Yep. How about- it's, uh, yeah. You know, and, and as far as language goes, I'm afraid I need... All the words that I can get my hands on to say what I want to say, and please don't take away my words. I, there are really, you know, there are uses for them. <laughs> exactly, especially this in conversations. Very 1984, isn't it? Yes, that's right. <laughs> but no, um, I have reached out. Uh, I'm, actually, I haven't. I, I, it took me two years. I finally found Aaron Noble. Oh, great. And I'm going to reach out to her sometime this month. Hopefully I can get her on here. She did do an interview on the Blu-ray, so I'm thinking that I might be, I might be to get her. Sure, yeah. Yeah. I can hear. I think so. I can hear about how you whisked out in the alley. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, that really uh-huh. worked out. The reason that worked out like that was a blocking thing. It just put me in the position where when Perry and Roddy came down the alley and, you know, were facing off Tim, I would be behind them, particularly behind Roddy with the razor so that we could exchange that threatening look Mm -hmm. and all that jazz. So a lot of this stuff sometimes, you know, looks, it, it, it almost accidentally takes on meaning of its own. But when you get right down, you know, it's like you read up, a review of a movie and they say you know i know in the barroom scene the red tablecloth on a single table and you know symbolizes the blood of the thing and the truth is is when they were shooting that there was like a light kick off the table and the cameraman said hey somebody grab that tablecloth from over there and put it on this table i'm getting a light kick so you know <laughs> <laughs> you just don't know yeah yeah, and I have reached out, like I said, to Perry King a couple of times, you know, on his web page, but I haven't heard back, and I don't know whether it's because he had issues with the film or or maybe saw it, <laughs> maybe he just doesn't want to talk to me. He wouldn't be the first no, person. It's not the first one, I can tell you that. I think I think he maybe did have some issues with it. Um, apparently, again, uh, I understand. At least I understand that um, that uh, he's. You know, you know this happens with a lot of these kind of things. I mean, you know, sometimes you do stuff and 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 the experience itself maybe wasn't a great experience or what was happening in, you know, your life at the time which had nothing to do with the project was really bad. You know, that stuff happens. I worked with a, a guy, a record producer who worked with the Rolling Stones and, you know, he told me a story of of Turning the Rolling Stones on to the the, the album Aftermath, uh, a record that they had never listened to, because it was you know they recorded it and mixed it and put it out during a year when they were arrested and this happened and people were dying and all this horrible stuff was going on. They never listened to it, mm-hmm. didn't have time, and they didn't want to, you know. So you know these things happen, you know. So I think. Um, from my understanding, but, but, you know, over the years and time goes by and you start feeling like, who cares, big deal. Listen, I, you know, for a while, I didn't really want to be identified as Barry Lockridge from Land of the Giants. No. And, you know, in my 20s and stuff, I kind of stayed away from that and was like, look, I'm just, <laughs> I really, I'm not that guy. I just don't want to be that guy. And that's just, you know... Uh, the way we are and, you know, we establish new identities for ourselves as actors or artists or whatever. But after a while, like I say, you kind of break down on it and you say, ah, what the hell? What's the big deal? 
Yeah. <laughs> I, th- I think that may be where a lot of people involved in Class of 84 are now, you know. Well, Mary Lynn Ross uh, had some good, very good experiences on it, and I had her on in 2015, and I had her on again last year. I had her and Belinda yeah. Belansky on, both of them for the second time. Uh, she and Belinda were both in Bobby Joe and the Outlaw, which, of course, right. M- Mark Lester directed, and, of course, it's the mm-hmm. movie that Timothy Van Patten's watching at his little apartment there with his right. mom. <laughs> with Marjo. Yeah, so I, I had them both on here, and it was just nice to hear those two talk back and forth and uh i'm still in touch with mary mary lynn and uh, i'll probably ha- try to have her on again this year and talk about her uh youtube uh uh videos because she she's very yeah. very active in that yep yep but uh i love mary mary lynn and i'm gonna tell you i just i just know that what, during the rape scene you know i think the guys <laughs> were more more upset about it than she was <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you want to make sure that, you know, uh, you know, when you're faced with doing something like that, you know, you, you want to do it right. And you don't want to hurt anybody. And it's just a movie and, you know, and and uh, and all of that. And plus, you know, uh, yeah, it generally is that way. I did this other picture where I had to play this horrendous serial killer guy and, you know, the movie opened with me, you know, roughing up this girl and dragging her by the hair and what movie her with was this? And all this stuff. <laughs> and it was this actress named Alberta Maines, a really, really wonderful actress, and I we'd never met. And and I, you know, and there was nothing. This was a really uh, terrible character. I really had a hard time with this one. Actually, this is really dreadful creature. And. Uh, and I had to keep saying, you know, listen, uh, you know, I have to, <laughs> I have to do this stuff. <clears throat> Is it going to really, <clears throat> if I have to drag you like down this road? I mean, I don't want to hurt you, you know. And I'm, I'm trying to figure out how, you know. Oh, it's okay, you know. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and, you know. Oh, don't worry, you know. And uh, no, she was fantastic. Well, you know, Marilyn Ross again. You know, that's not an easy thing to do. And no, she was very, she was very, she was very good in that scene. So in many ways, yeah, you're probably right. We were probably more concerned about, you know, what we were doing than, than she was. And she was the executive producer. <laughs> I know. Talk about stepping up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But no, uh, again, Timothy Van Patten. I found no contact info for, but. I don't know. Like, when I hear that he didn't like doing the movie, it almost make, makes me wonder whether it's even worth reaching out. <laughs> well, you know, um, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, it's hard to say. I mean, I know that Tim wasn't really, really, like, really looking to be an actor when it's a weird story and it has to do with uh, the 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 uh, distributors in the movie simply wanted Avan Patton. I don't think they knew, nor did they care which one they got. I think they thought they wanted Vince. Vince didn't want to do it. Vince called Tim. Tim really wasn't an actor. Tim said, Vince told Tim, you want to go to this movie? Go show up in Toronto. They don't care. They just want Avan Patton. So it was kind of like that. And then, you know, and Tim had, you know, a stab at doing some other stuff and doing the show White Shadow and all of that. And I think it was all fine, but I always got the feeling from Tim that he had other aspirations. You know, I got the feeling on the set of 84 that, you know, acting to him didn't was not really fulfilling. He didn't mind, but it wasn't really what he was into. He was always behind the camera looking at what was going on and looking at the shots and, you know, all that stuff. So uh, draw, then, draw, know, when he finally started directing Sopranos, that was no surprise. And I think he's very happy doing what he's doing. He, Of course, behind the scenes, he was drawing your uh, skeleton skull and crossbones <laughs> on your shirt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, he's a very creative guy, very clever guy. I think acting was just not really his thing. and uh, But he sure is a terrific director and producer. That happens a lot. Look at Ron Howard. Yes. Sure. Yes, because Ron Howard is able to step away because he can get his brother Clint to fill in for him. <laughs> he can be the on-screen Howard. Ron and, and Brian Grazer are doing such great work with uh, television stuff, what with the Mars series from a year ago or whatever, and uh, and then now Genius, the Einstein thing with Jeffrey Rush. Yeah. Just 
you know, brilliant television, really, really well done. And they're doing it through, through people like National Geographic. That's the thing. There's so many delivery systems now. You know, this is a, a real golden time to be making product because, you know, what do we got? You know, 11,000 channels and, <laughs> yeah. you know, and YouTube and this and, and Netflix and streaming. Everybody's got a streaming service now. HBO has a streaming service. Everybody. And uh, so, you know, guess what? They need product, you know. So this is a big time. Could you product ima- that's not reality TV. Yeah. No, well, that'll do. But, I mean, you know, it would be nice if we could, like, <laughs> fill in the space. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> could you imagine what Class of 1984 would have been like if Vincent Van Patten did it? Because Vincent Van Patten, of course, was in rock and roll high school playing yes. this doofus football player. Mm-hmm. You, 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 I keep hearing actors complaining about playing the same part over and over. This mm-hmm. would have been a nice, interesting switch for him. Yeah. Yeah, like I, I can't. I, I, my understanding was he just wasn't interested at all. I think there was a play he wanted to do or something. I, I don't really remember now. He just it just didn't do anything for him at all. Oh gee. So he passed it on, which I'm going good, fine, you know. But um, yeah, you know, he get <laughs> <laughs> as far as being typecast, you know, I, I, you know, I, I. I <laughs> You know, that's, unfortunately, the way you look and the way that you come across, is, you know, um, on film is going to dictate what people are going to think of you as. And and I don't mind typecasting as long as that means working. Okay. You know, um, I've played a lot of the same guys, like 11 vampires and uh, I don't know how many drug addicts and car thieves and hit men and crap like that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and fine, you know. You're I mean, always in uh, trouble. <laughs> Yeah, you know, hey, the money spends the same, and and, uh, <laughs> and and it's nice to be working. Sure, it's fun to be able to do, uh, you know, uh, stuff that's different. But for me, I've always kind of had the thing of, um, you know, I have I have my writing and my music, you know, and yeah. that's mine, and I control that mm-hmm. uh, exclusively. So I can go there and do that, and that's me, and that's mine, and I did that. When I work as an actor, I didn't write the movie. I, even if I even if I wound up ad libbing a lot of dialogue, I didn't write it, and I have no claim to it. And I, it's not my movie, and I didn't direct it. I'm a gun for hire, and I come in and I do you know the best job I know how, and that's that. And then it goes away, and and my memory of doing it hopefully is good, and now it's out there. But the music thing, of course, is just personally, I think, a lot more satisfying. You know, and everybody needs that. Everybody needs something oh, yeah. theirs. Now, of course, R.I.P. Keith Knight. Of course, I know we mentioned this before, but uh, we can't have a 35th anniversary chat about Class of 1984 without mentioning the mm-hmm. guy who played such a lo- lovable guy in Meatballs and then playing <laughs> Barnyard. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, if there's such a thing as a lovable 300-pound thug, uh, <laughs> <laughs> he did it. Uh, and Keith is just really one of the one of the sweetest people, and I know that you know it's easy to say, and people always you know praise those who are no longer with us. But in all honesty, Keith was a genuinely great person to work with, and just a good person to know, and and in his own way, really kind of you know set a tone. You know, for all of us, uh, he always had a sense of humor when uh, when things were n- not always real funny. <laughs> yeah. And, of course, I've mentioned I reached out to Neil Clifford, and I got kind of turned down. But uh, i got to say, though, I-, I-, I loved watching him move whenever he had that fight uh, before he meets his end with the table saw. Just, I guess he was a dancer. and I yes, guess he was. W- yeah, w- Neil was originally a dancer and studied dance, and, and uh, yeah, that's... He he knows how to move. Like when they were going chasing after that drug dealer, and he was jumping over the bat, bar- like there's oh, something very rhythmic about that, you know. And and uh, that's all Neil too. It's uh, yeah. I mean, uh, other than uh, other, than, well, I don't even know if he had any stunt doubling really. Yeah, because he, like when he was uh, fighting uh, Mr. Norris or Perry King mm-hmm. there by the table that's saw, that. like that was almost. Um, 
I hate to use the word musical, but just by the way mm-hmm. he was moving and then Perry King ducks a chain, you know, there was something very methodical about it that it worked. Yeah. Well, between Terry Leonard and Neil, you know, the, and, and Perry, of course, you know, they choreographed that. They did a great job. No, Neil was uh, was very conscious of that, and, and I thought he had a really terrific physical presence. You always got a sense of him in every shot, and you could always see him kind of moving or, you know, flexing or looking around or, you know, really he he didn't. That's what was really nice about that for for essentially what would have been, you know, uh, um, just sort of antagonist characters that you know all we had to do really was just be naughty. Yeah. And uh, everybody actually took the time to invest those characters <laughs> with with genuine personality, yeah. which which is unusual. And everybody did. Yeah. One, one person. Yeah, and uh, Neil Clifford had quite the presence. I yeah, I, I know his experience with the film was not positive and. Uh, I don't blame him. I understand, I guess, his uh, daughter was born or something like that, and he yep. couldn't leave the set. I understand him being pissed off about that. I don't blame him either. Well, you know, <coughs> it wasn't a big-budget movie, Yeah, and uh, it was shot very fast um, mm-hmm. for the times in in Toronto, and, uh, and again, split cast. Uh, there were, you know, principal actors that were brought up from America um, on SAG contracts, and then Everybody else was Canadian actors on actor contracts, and unfortunately, it's a little better now, but it does show up in places. There is a lot of... They, they just treat people differently, and it's it's really a shame. They treat the American actors better than they treat the Canadian actors, and they're shooting on the Canadian actors' home soil. I, I think it's quite outrageous. Yeah, Deadpool was shot up here, but yet it's an mm-hmm. American film. Like, I, I mm-hmm. don't get the government here at all. Like, why not try to get her, our own films with our own stamp on it, you know? There's a problem with that, I'm afraid, and it's something that I encountered starting very early on in in, in the late 70s and early 80s when I first started going up to Canada to, to work, and then also I produced uh, some stuff up in Canada with a company that I formed in Vancouver, and um, we just had this constant problem with um, um, the Canadian film industry um, and the government in particular being very shy about wanting to do stuff that would stand out because, and you know, I hope no one's offended by this, but my feeling has always been that that you know that. Canada is afraid to alienate the United States because they bring big pictures up there to shoot on location. And yes, they spend a lot of money, but simply, com- and, and so there's a sense of non-competition. Yeah. And uh, and and like we don't want to alienate the U.S. or we don't want you know by do- by you know making movies that are going to compete with them. And of course, I think that's crazy. But. This has apparently been going on for a long time. I remember my father telling me about, you know, when he was a um, you know, young man working with the CBC and NFB and stuff and how they abolished any kind of star system. They just said, you know, oh, we're not going to, you know, everything up here is fair, so no stars, everybody's the same, mm-hmm. you know, and, and CBC still has a habit of, you know, in, in, with 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 the very well-intentioned idea of being fair and giving everybody a chance, they're canceling series that don't need to be canceled because, oh, well, you've had your five years. Now it's somebody else's turn. Oh, gee. You know, and, and, and I understand the attitude, and I know it's very well-meaning, but it's just not how this industry works. Nope. <laughs> you know? That seems very unfair when they have a following. Yeah. Well, yeah. It is. <laughs> well, it is. so yeah, it's just something that you know. You know, it's 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 tough. Listen, it's tough being the border country to the United States. It yeah. just is. It's tough for Mexico. It's tough for Canada too. And yeah. and yes, there is that. You know, I think Canada. Canada, if it were somewhere, if it were like where Switzerland is, would be very different place. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but being next to the United States is. You know, there's good things, but there's bad things, too. I just wonder, and going back to Keith Knight, uh, did have you talked to him since class of 1984? Like, do you remember your last conversation with him before he passed? 
You know, I did talk to Keith, um, not a lot, but but reasonably frequently over the like a couple of years after the movie, and I ran into him. Ugh, maybe it was a TIFF at Toronto Film Festival. Mm-hmm. It was I think the last time I actually saw him, and uh, uh, that would have been yeah not long before he died. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I did, I, for some reason we did sort of stay in touch and, um, um, but you know, not, not regularly, not as much as I would have liked to. I, he was a lot of fun and a very funny guy. I always enjoyed talking to Keith and I certainly enjoyed working with him. Well, what about uh, Neil bad. Clifford? You still in touch with him? No, you know, I haven't spoken to Neil in quite some time, although I'm absolutely confident that if we talked today, it would be like we had, you know, we're picking it up from, you know, 35 years ago. So, because he's just a very consistent guy and a very sweet guy. So, but no, I I haven't. He really kind of, after class of 84, I think he, well, first of all, you know, his daughter was born, and and so he, he had to refocus his life on family and and all of that, and mm-hmm. then I think he, um, I think he made a decision somewhere in there that he just didn't want to, he didn't want to pursue acting, and he, you know, started sculpting. And he's been very successful. I've seen some of his work. He's a great sculptor. I looked Got over a great his web page. Oh yeah, I've been on there. That's where I mm-hmm. made contact with him. But mm-hmm. no, and I understand he turned me down. You know, but I don't want to hassle somebody to do my show. But it would have been interesting to hear his stories. That's for sure. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, yeah. you know, you never know. Like I say, I, I did speak with Lisa not long ago who said that she had spoken to both Neil, Perry, and, and apparently Tim, and, 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 and that under the proper circumstances, they would have, you know, they, they no longer have any great issue with it. Now, that's not a commitment or anything like that, but I, it's, it's ten. It, like I said, it's, it fits my own experience. And I think a lot of people I've known, sometimes it's just doing this work is just you're doing it at a difficult time or it's a difficult job and and you just kind of want it to go away (laughs) and then after a while it just becomes part of your life and it's no big deal maybe the right time is python's paradise my show who's promoted the movie more than me well well, (laughs) that's right well we'll see that would be fun and get everybody on the phone i'm sure why not I mean, seriously, do you know anybody that's promoted this film more than I have? And I mean, I'm the same, saying not. it to brag, no. but really, seriously. No, I don't think so, no. Yeah, like I've been on fire with, that's one of the films. I've, <laughs> I've celebrated a, a lot of anniversaries this year. And um, okay, it, I, I'm I'm going to put your bid at the top of the stack. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and 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 uh, I actually do have to call Lisa soon. We're sort of in touch about some other stuff, and um, I'll see what's going on, you know, with everybody, and you know, if there's uh, and certainly make you know this invitation available, and we'll see what happens. Well, as long as, uh, like, I, I can only, like, I'm only able to talk to you and Claire because you and Claire are connected there. Right. I don't have it set up here so I could call out different people. <laughs> mm-hmm. That could okay. be problematic. Well, we, but we can figure something out. You know, I mean, if it, you know, we'll figure it out. Just rent out a stadium or something. You know? <laughs> you know, yeah, well, just in Madison Square Garden, you know, it's no big deal. Um, <laughs> we'll just pony up and... <laughs> I haven't talked a lot about Lisa here, and I, I gotta say, love Lisa, and um, and uh, I had her on a couple. Of, I was supposed to have her on last year, but I know she's really, really busy with something in Toronto. Yeah, yeah. Working with Moses Amir. Yep. Yeah. And um, but her, but her manager Mike keeps me quite busy. He sent me uh, three. Yeah, Mike sent me three guests already this year. Terrific. Oh yeah. He sent me quite a few people, so um, I'm, I'm in touch with him. And uh, he said Lisa's pl- planning to come on hopefully maybe this summer, so I'll have her oh, back yeah. on. Oh, yeah. Yeah, she's, just, she's been really busy, and, and it's great, and she's into production now and, and you know, doing a hell of a job. Uh, she's fascinating. She worked a long time. And, and remember, Lisa had uh, uh, two careers going in Canada. She had, you know, um, uh, she, she did... Uh, a whole series of francophone films, Quebecois films, where she was, you know, the starlet. 
and uh, um, and then she also did English language films. And, and she she would always do supporting roles in English. She always used to complain about this. She'd do supporting roles in English language films, and she'd be the star of these French movies. So it was like back and forth. But no, she's uh, she's something. So anyway, I wish her well with her new her new endeavors. And yeah, we'll be talking soon. I'll I'll, I'll mention to her your your invitation, and we'll see what we can we can do. Oh yeah. Yeah, well, I know. She's working. We saw her on a few Lifetime movies. Oh yeah, she yeah, she's definitely she she's still working. Oh yeah, she oh yeah, I. Too. Oh, she's stunning. I I I, I, me- I remember I was smitten with Patsy when I first saw <laughs> Class of 1984. <laughs> now my mom didn't like the fact that I was smitten with Patsy. <laughs> well, moms never like the fact that you're smitten. <laughs> my mom's like, you could do better than that. She tried to mm-hmm. run her teacher over. <laughs> That's right. Well, you know, Lisa had absolutely no idea. Her, by her own admission, she had absolutely no idea what to do about that character at all. She's never been faced with anything like that. And she just didn't. It's not her world. And it was just like, what the hell? So actually, um, you know, we, we all kind of spent a lot of time talking about that kind of stuff. And, you know, I guess I had the most sort of history with, like, you know, punks and stuff like that. So I was able to fill in some historical blanks and <laughs> things like that. But but I think she did an incredible job. She just, oh, yeah. Uh, you know, it was, it's, a, it's a wonderful character. And, and, again, you know, along with all these characters seem to stand out. Normally in a movie like this, these characters wouldn't stand out. Nope. It's really quite remarkable. But, I mean, I know people that are just, you know, they know these names. They know Barnyard. They know Fallon. They know Drugstore. They know Patsy. They know Stegman. They know these people, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's really it's amazing. You never know. Yeah, actually, I, I think Fallon was probably the most criminally insane of the bunch. He, he'd yeah, been the he one i have been. best friends. That was something that Neil and I decided early on was is that Fallon and Drugstore were, like, looking out for each other. Because I found with him... I, I think he would have been the one I would have been the most afraid of in real life. Yes. Yep. Yes, and well, you should be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, ex- with the exception of approaching Norris after the car wreckage thing, mm-hmm. uh, Stegman doesn't do anything without his uh, boys. No, that's right. Except for that one scene where he comes in there and, uh, after his car got wrecked. He did approach Norris. Mm-hmm. Yep. And, of course, uh, Drugstore, as we discussed, um, <laughs> a little bit of a wuss. Just kind of a weasel, yeah. 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 Okay, I just have other people do my dirty work. <laughs> Vinny Contino. Actually, Vinny Contino, is, that's one of Keith Knight's contributions. We were sitting at the table, and there was this kid who, was gonna, who, who Mark had picked to be the guy to, that I gave the knife to to go mm-hmm. stab Michael with. Mm-hmm. And we were just sitting around the table joking, blocking this thing. And and, and and Keith just said, Vinny, Vinny Contino. <laughs> and that was it. You know, that was that was the character's name. Bing Vinny. And of That's course, a great name. Little yeah. magic trick. <laughs> and of yep. course, Keith Knight uh, and um, Fallon were kind of the, the two thugs. But Keith Knight, there was something kind of playful about him when he brings that kid in there. Um, uh, he has a little uh, bat to the back of his head, but he's doing it in a playful manner. Whereas mm-hmm. Fallon, Fallon was a little scarier, I felt. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Fallon yeah, would yeah. be the one I would not want to cross out of the bunch. Yes, yes. Yep. Barn war- barnyard would certainly hurt you if you got in the way. Yep. Fallon would hurt you for fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I always felt that, and I think I mentioned this before, I wish there had been a subplot where maybe Michael J. Fox would have had another friend that was smitten with Patsy. Well, I would have done something there. There kind of was an expanded thing that we were going down for a while on on the Michael Fox thing and and also, uh, what's his name? Joe Kell? Yeah, who jumped off the flagpole Mm -hmm. and did all that great stuff. And there was a thing about the drug sales, and then, of course, Al Waxman is the cop and the whole thing. But it just kind of didn't really float, and, and, and I don't think we even shot much of it. <laughs> and what we did shot didn't make it to the movie, because it, just, it, just, it was a little distracting. Uh, I think it was, it was better to keep it simple. I know what you mean, but, and there was an attempt to do that, but I think it just got a little muddy. Well, more Lisa's 
makes me happy. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. yeah. But, uh, but, you know, you got to keep them wanting more, you know. <laughs> 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 but but uh Lisa too I also have to do a nice shout out because Lisa also did the the doubt fireface depression challenge that I threw that's that right out. that's right and that got a lot of hits on YouTube my mine doesn't even have 100 hits <laughs> the one I did oh yeah and I'm sorry I, I just wasn't able to get the and, and get a hold of Jenny and get that stuff going and all that but we'll get something for you oh you and Jenny you going to do that together well I was going to get her to do it for you for sure Oh yeah, I definitely want to see Jenny do it, so, but but like I say, she didn't have to get a hold of her right now because she's writing and everything. But you know, well, I'll get something together for you. Okay, you're still doing that, right? Oh yeah, I've actually I've actually had good, some good responses. Right. Uh, uh, Lisa did it. Nancy McLaughlin from Friday the Thirteenth Part Six, Jason Lives, did it. Good. And she well, had a you know Claire and I'll do it. You yeah. Throw pie in my face. Or Not something. a problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not a problem. <laughs> is Claire up for it as well? Oh, I think. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't, as long as I don't have to clean it up, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, and Jenny, absolutely. I'm trying to get awareness for depression because nobody takes it seriously, and at yeah. least, and Lisa it's totally to did. Better, but it's a long road. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I, I'm, I'm oh, like I've made, a, I made some donations to a charity that Lisa's involved in with the Single Moms Planet, and uh, sure, sure. I made some donations in her honor, and it's my way of saying thanks, you know. Yeah, yeah. And I've had some other people. I just had a UK actress I interviewed send me a video on Messenger, and she said, "You know, is this what you were looking for?" And I was like, "Yeah, that's totally it." Uh, Terrific. So. Terrific. I've had I've had a few takers on that, you know, and um, I try to be patient with people. I've got some people I've been waiting over a year, but again, it's a matter of scheduling, you know. So, well, yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, I always am going to uh, very well appreciate Lisa for doing that, and uh, oh yeah, yeah. And I know it was something that her son had fun at. <laughs> yes, uh, yes, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, but. Um, I, I uh, always loved Lisa in that movie, and she's an example of somebody. Every time she is on screen, she appreciated me bringing this up because uh, even when she's not the focus, she's always doing something. Like That's you, right. when she enters the classroom there in that opening scene, she grabs uh, Aaron Noble's flute mm -hmm. and starts sucking on it. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like little things like that. Or you see, like when they they go to grab uh, Aaron Noble, Michael J. Fox, and uh, Timothy Van Patten's like, you want to have a chatty waddy with you because you got those finger gestures <laughs> out of mm -hmm. out of Lisa. Like Lisa is always always c contributing, uh, even when she's not the focus. And uh, I think that's a sign of a a real t team player. Absolutely. Oh yeah, yeah. Yep. Well, again, you know, I mean, the characters for that movie, the the gang, was pretty sparsely written in the original script. The, the, you know, it was really, that was an actor ensemble thing, and I think Mark knew that from the beginning, and, you know, and he needed to cast actors who were going to be quick on their feet, because, I mean, in the case of Drugstore, there was almost no dialogue for Drugstore in the yeah. movie, because they, they didn't know. They just said, we got this guy, we want to call him Drugstore, he's a really vicious little character, we just don't know. Come and do this, say whatever you want, wear your own clothes, you know, which is what I did. And so we, we it, was, it was very creative for everybody in one sense. So in that sense, it was a really good experience for everyone, and Lisa too, because she was kind of adrift. She didn't know what the hell she was supposed to do. Again, very little dialogue written in the script. Mm -hmm. Most of the dialogue you hear Lisa say is, is hers. Mm -hmm. and, and, it's, and all that business is basically, that's hers, absolutely. Yeah. And uh and and we were kind of forced to do that because there was nobody really going to tell us not to and there was nobody going to tell us what to do instead. <laughs> so <laughs> And of course I always find it bizarre because Lisa as Patsy's the one that tells the girl to take her clothes off uh, back in mm -hmm. that room. Mhm. Mm Very unusual. Yep. Not to mention free range acting. I didn't I had no idea. Oh yeah. Yeah, we no. we pretty much improvised those scenes together yeah well, that's impressive i think that's impressive yeah i mean they had structure we knew what we were doing you know the script was in the scene this is the scene where the gang does this 
But uh, sometimes it was no more <laughs> it was no more graphic than that. The gang does this, <laughs> and that's it. And and we had to come up with it. So that hmm. was fun. And Joe Kell, I've reached out to a couple of times too. I know Lisa had mentioned that Joe Kell would probably do the show, but oh, I'm sure. Yeah, Chief, I've reached out to him twice, and uh, oh. I haven't heard back. Uh, well, we're just going to have to get these people organized. We don't... <laughs> Here's the what priorities com- and straight. Joe Kell is a confusion to me because on the Internet yeah. Movie Database, right? Um, I know he directed Lisa and Summer Eleven. Mm-hmm. And he worked, I know, with Leslie Donaldson in a movie called uh, Special People. Right. But yet you, you, you look on Internet Movie Database, you see no mention of Class of 1984 or Deadly Eyes, where she worked with Lisa and Leslie. Right. And uh, I'm, like, finding it hard to find record of him even in, being listed as being in Class of 1984 or Deadly Eyes, both shot in Canada. Yeah. And I'm like, well, <laughs> that you know, that just does happen. And and unfortunately, you know, if you don't have a good agent and you don't have, you know, some kind of, you know, clout in this, um, you really just can. They'll use you, and you're you gone. And and uh, you know, billing is something you have to negotiate and ask for. And, uh, you know, I mean, if you don't ask for it, you don't negotiate for it, your agent doesn't negotiate for it, they're just fine with not listing you. <laughs> well, they or putting you in the cast list at the end of the movie. Well, no the, his problem. his name is at the end of the movie. That's mm-hmm. that. It's just on the Internet Movie Database. Right. Um, like, you you look through his credit list and you don't there find... There may be he... reasons for that we don't know. You know, maybe yeah. union things. Maybe he wasn't union on one thing and maybe he was union on another. Maybe he did a non-union film and maybe he doesn't want that crossing. You just don't know. There's all kinds of weird complexities. And then, like I say, some people, you know, feel like, oh, if people associate me with this picture, then they're not going to see this new picture the way I want them to. And, yeah, you just, you don't know. You got any? Uh, There's you, reasons for it, but you know, probably if we knew what they were, we wouldn't fully understand. <laughs> <laughs> you got any stories about Al Waxman? You know, Al Waxman, ex- other than other than you know, consummate professional, and 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 that makes it hard to have stories about because he came in, mm-hmm. and uh, I think he, uh, I th- maybe three days just came in we shot all his scenes it was all very you know no more than five takes on anything ba boom ba boom ba boom and that's pretty difficult with like six people in a room you know I mean, it's one thing to do something in one take if it's just you or just you and another person but to get something off in like two to five takes when you got like six eight people in a room that's pretty good so we shot very fast with al waxman he was very nice mm-hmm. was very professional um uh, he wasn't Mr. Warmth. I mean, he didn't come and you know meet us all and you know and, and you know hang out or anything. But you know, no. Why should he? I mean, he was coming in to do a job and he was you know doing a few days on this movie and and uh, yeah, no, he was slick and very professional, very nice, very easy to work with, and uh, like that. Yeah, it's no. pretty much what you'd expect. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, um, it's funny because it reminds me. Speaking of meeting people and whatnot, uh, we just recently lost um, uh, Roger Moore, and I've interviewed yeah. a couple of people who worked with Roger Moore, and they said he was one of these guys that would like. I interviewed somebody who did stunts in one of the Bond movies, and she mm. said that Roger Moore was one of these guys that would come over and meet the behind the camera people. <laughs> Sure. Oh, yeah. I believe that. Uh, Roger Moore been around a long, 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 long time. And, and generally speaking, people who've been around a long, 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 long time, you know, if, if they didn't have, you know, the good sense to do that in the beginning, they learn. You know, because, uh, you know, the everybody on that set is integral to making that picture or whatever it is, and, and, and particularly the people behind the camera. I mean, we're just the monkeys acting the stuff out in front of the camera. If it isn't lit right and the costumes aren't right and the camera isn't right, and the, you know, then we're wasting our time. You know, and everybody, you know, has value on a set. And, you, you know, you need to, it's very important, you know. You, you, want, you want those, you know, you want makeup and hair to like you. 
You mm-hmm. know, they're going to make you look good. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Or not. <laughs> or yeah. not. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, not. You know? So, you know, it's, yeah. So, yeah, I've never worked with Roger Moore. Uh, my mom had a big crush on him. Uh, I'm sure that she loved the saint. I remember that. But uh, I'm sure that, uh, no, I, it makes perfect sense. I'm sure he was a very charming guy. I've never heard anything bad about him. <laughs> now, of course, uh, you know, we can't... Uh, uh, talk about class of 1984 without talking about Roddy McDowell. Oh, now that yeah, scene well. in the classroom where he takes <laughs> uh, the gun out and teaches. Mm-hmm. Cl- <laughs> I, th- I think mm-hmm. Fallon might have been the only smart one that didn't uh, get caught up in that. He never addresses Fallon, but I'll tell you the rest of you. <laughs> you guys get your questions asked, and you end up having to stand up for yours. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that was a lot of fun, and like I think I told you before, I uh, I first met Ronnie McDowell when I was probably about eight years old, and I came out to Hollywood the first time from here in New York to to do a film at MGM, and, and I was uh, put up at the Chateau Marmont, and Roddy lived there, and Roddy had been a child actor in Hollywood, so, you know, he kind of took me under his wing. He was very, very friendly and very good friends with my folks, and, and, um, and he was... Um, you know, a very subtle but a very nice guide, sort of to dealing with, you know, this industry, and uh, and uh, wonderful photographer. Took some great pictures of me when I was a kid, yeah. and um, he said, "No, he was a terrific guy." But again, it's very difficult to work with people that you know or family members in in, in this business. It seems you know, everyone talks about nepotism and everything like that, but I'll tell you, it just takes for, you know, I've worked with only one member of my family. Well, I worked with my mom once doing some voiceover things. And my dad and I once, when I was like five, we did a Hallmark Hall of Fame Cyrano de Bergerac together. That's it. I mean, you know, it's like, <laughs> and, you know, so you know people for years, you never work with them. But, you know, occasionally it does happen. Yeah. It's always nice when it does. You know, um, that Central High, our Central Tech. Yeah. Uh, I know if I ever go to Toronto, I said, <laughs> what? Yeah, yeah, if I get to New Brunswick, I've never been outside New Brunswick. But if I ever, ever? go, no. <laughs> But as far as I've been is to Moncton, New Brunswick, and I went to an Avril Lavigne concert, you know, but there you go. I never travel. But, um, yeah, I said if I ever go to Toronto, one of the things I want to do is look at the locations where Class of 1984 was shot, as well as look at the house where Black Christmas was shot as well. Yeah, cause, right. Because uh, I interviewed that a couple. That I know is still there because yeah. I know that people have gone to see it. But yeah. I can't. I have no idea whether Central Tech Local High School still exists or is still there. Uh, interestingly enough, Central Tech is not too far from the uh, area, the neighborhood I was born in. Okay. So, uh, but yeah, it was uh, yeah Lincoln High, of course. Lincoln High. Yeah. Well, we we're supposed to be Chicago. This was you know, <laughs> Toronto is Chicago. All right. <laughs> yeah, that that I I want to visit all those places. Uh, if I happen to ever be in Toronto, s- stop by. I don't know whether they'd let me inside or not, but but I'd I'd love to check out the locations. E- even like the like even the s- smaller places, like even where where the alley was and places like that. You know, or that's right off a of Young Street. And I wish I could remember the cross street that it's on, but I can't. But it's right off a of Young Street. All, almost all those st- street shots with us driving the cars and everything were all down uh, Young Street. Oh, maybe it's like Young and Bloor. No, no. It's right around there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I know. I I heard that through the commentary, though. I don't think Mr. Submarine is on that corner anymore. Yeah. What's Mr. Submarine? I guess it's a like Subway only. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's a sub. It was a sub shop thing. Yeah. How cute. Yeah. Yeah. You can tell I watched that movie really well. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And of course, we got to address Teenage Head. I, I was happy to have Gord Lewis on. I was I was told that since the lead singer is gone, I was talking yeah. to a uh, a friend of mine who I interviewed on here, who, who was in a movie in, uh, way back in two thousand with Catherine Mary Stewart. I had him on here, and he he was telling me if I'm going to interview somebody from Teenage Head and the lead singer's gone, uh, get hold of Gord Lewis. He'd be the guy to talk to. Yeah. So uh, 
I was happy to have him come on. His interview hasn't aired yet, so. Oh, that's great. Please, please drop me a note when it does, because I'd love to hear it. Oh, yeah. Did you ever see, uh, and speaking of weird little films in the 80s, did you ever see a, a, a movie uh, called uh, uh, New Year's Evil with, with. Uh, yes. With, yeah, yeah, yeah. With, yes. Uh, what's her name with Roz? Uh, Kelly? I don't remember the name of the actors, but I know which one you're talking right. to. She was a DJ, and she was getting all these. Uh, right. She was in Happy Days. For a while. Ross Kelly, I think. Yeah, Ross uh... Kelly, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, listen, this is funny. You know, Do you remember the band in that movie? Yes, yes. Well, that band is called Made in Japan, and it's run, it was started by a friend, really old friend of mine named Tony Harris Freed in L.A., and through a series of machinations over the last few years... You know, so and so bought. It's big fish eats little fish, right? Okay. So Canon Group, which owned that film, and and Made in Japan, Tony wrote all the music for that, and Made in Japan played all the music for the film, okay. as well as being in it. So, uh, MGM had bought Canon Group, but then MGM was sold out and bought. By, so things were on auction blocks. Well, a company called Hozak Records in Chicago bought the rights to the music to f- <laughs> New Year's Evil. Okay. So, which means they're going to re-release it. So now Tony's in a studio in, been going back between England and L.A., recording, re-recording and doing, you know, fixing up the tracks from <laughs> three years ago for this record. For, You know, he's an interesting guy, old Tony. You should have him on sometime. I should. You'll have to Facebook me his name so I can. I will. Yeah, so because I'm always looking out to, especially in, interviewing people from these uh, more obscure films like Midnight or New Year's Evil. Too, and his father was uh, Seymour Freed, who was a very, very famous attorney and then later judge in Los Angeles. And Seymour was Lenny Bruce's lawyer, and you know all kinds of people. So Tony, uh, Tony, uh, interesting guy. Yeah. Yeah, I'll shoot you his uh, number and he's on Facebook. Sure. And of course, Teenage Head, I got to say, you got him singing uh, Ain't Got No Sense. But I always said my favorite Teenage Head song is never credited at the end of the movie, but it's there Little Boxes. What? It's not credited? It's not credited. It's not even listed at the end of the movie. And you can clear, even Gord Lewis said, yeah, it's there. Oh yeah, you can hear they little. They must have been. They must have pulled like the twenty-second rule or something. Well, it's uh, there know. more than twenty seconds. Yeah, I know. Because that whole scene where the woman's getting naked there in the back, yep. you yep. can hear uh, little boxes and that chorus, alimony, That's and you can strange. hear that. That's so strange. You know, they must have just. That must have just been just an error. Somebody who was doing the source music credits didn't recognize that as being, you know. That's, that's, yeah, that's crazy. Because you can clearly, it's not oh, even yeah. real background. You can clearly hear it. Well, we, so we, we went around and we said, you know, we found, we found the punks in the punk club in Toronto. And we said, okay, who's, who's the band that ought to do this? And, you know, and everybody said, you know, Teenage Head. So we went to Mark and uh, Arthur, the producer, and said, Teenage Head, and, they were they were already sort of on that, but you know, um, I think we made the deciding vote. <laughs> well, Gord Lewis, I know, said that there's supposed to be a greatest hits for Teenage Head come out, and he said that Little Boxes is on it. I don't know if uh, Ain't Got No Sense is on there, but he said Little Boxes is definitely on there. Good. <laughs> yeah, I I play that song quite a bit here on the show. I love that song. Great. Yeah, but um, yeah, that that. Uh, they they played some great music, and I said I was joking with Lisa and with Mary, and even with you, about the fact that it's the first time you got a woman getting naked, and here I'm more more attuned with the background <laughs> music. <laughs> well, after you've watched it a few times, I mean. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I heard that poor woman did not. You were talking about problems on the set. I guess she wasn't very comfortable either. No, I don't think so. She actually was one of many extras uh, that um, I think were not really treated very fairly. I mean, um, Mark sort of had a tendency to pull and run into the extras and pull one out and, you know, 
and that's that's difficult. But um, yeah, I think uh, I forget I forget her name, but um, because she just really uh, we we came in to do that scene one day, and we didn't have any idea who who was going to be this girl. We didn't even know exactly what was going to happen. And then Mark came in and said, "Well, this is what's going to happen," and told us what we you know. And mm-hmm. we said, "Oh, okay." And then um, you know, this girl was sort of picked out of the crowd and became the girl. Yeah. So, uh yeah, I don't know. You know, I I um I I remember that uh, I thought, you know, it was an uncomfortable scene. Yeah. <laughs> period. So, I remember thinking, I don't want to make this any worse and draw any attention to it. So, I'm just going to just sit over here and, you know, do my nasty thing and, you know, <laughs> just get through this, you know. <laughs> of course you do say, "Take your clothes off." Yeah, well, you know, we we have, you know, we have an image to keep up here. <laughs> Speaking of image, I know you're heavily into music, and I know you've sent me some MP3s, which I finally figured out how to get that to work, by the way. Oh, good. <laughs> I know you've had trouble sending them to me before, and it ended up being an issue on my end, something I was doing wrong. But yeah. Talk about... Oh, I'm glad you got something to play. Talk about... Um, uh, some of the music that you've been doing. Are you, are you part of a band? Uh, not right now. Um, I've been part of a lot of bands. Uh, the last band I had was ooh, many years ago in the '90s. Was a band called the Knights of the Living Dead that was uh, started by a guy named Roland Devoil and I. And I had been working with Warren Zevon writing. Some oh lyrics. yeah. Tunes of his, yeah, which was really an incredible honor. He did and Werewolves really, in London. Yeah, he's a tremendous guy. We became good friends, and he actually asked me to write with him, which was pretty amazing since he's only written with people like Springsteen and J.D. Souther and people like that. So that was a lot of fun. And then uh, it all sort of happened around the same time. I had met Roland, uh, who was a really talented musician and one of the most talented I know, and we started writing some songs together. And... Warren was sort of became involved. We went in the studio and Warren produced some stuff and then we were playing we played a lot in three years. I think we must have done three hundred shows. And um so uh yeah. It, it was interesting and uh um but no, through uh it's only been in the last few years that I really started writing uh new stuff again i sort of took a time off from that and i was in vancouver for several years and just really doing film and television work and stuff but since i've been back here in new york i've been working on new tunes and i've been using reverb nation to post some of them because it's you know just a place where people can hear them and uh but you know i'm always talking to people because i've I've been making records since i was about 12 because you know i think we talked about this before you know 1967 68 when you know if you were in a television show you know every week and you could fog a mirror you could make a record so you know i figured fine you know you exploit me i'll exploit you i i got to work in really great studios like sunset sound and wally hiders and places like that with incredible studio musicians and i really learned you know the craft uh which was important to me because i'd been playing music as a kid so so yeah so i'm i i really um i i you know i sort of just demo stuff at home and work on new tunes and stuff and uh it's remarkable the technology now is amazing I oh mean, yeah i can you know i can do stuff on my mac power book that you know used to cost thousands of dollars and you know <laughs> many hours and uh but yeah yeah so it's it's always fun i'm you know i'm always interested in looking for people to play with i have a friend here in town actually a friend of claire's recorded a an old night song that Roland and I wrote a, a Christmas song. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he's uh, he's recording that and uh, wants me to come in and play some guitar on that. So that'll be fun. Are you and Claire gonna do a rendition of uh, "I Got You, Babe"? <laughs> oh, yeah, we, well, we're going through material. We're, I'm writing some. I've written some tunes, of course, for for Claire. I mean, for Claire in the sense of about her and uh um and uh i'm working on some stuff for the two of us to do together and uh yeah of course she's a lot better singer than i am but you know, oh just a different type of voice. Uh, that's yeah. all what kind of instruments kind of like do you play Stefan? no and johnny cash <laughs> <laughs> no Stefan's voice have you heard him sing i haven't no 
Except uh, when he had the gun in his face in, uh, no. in yeah, Class yeah. of 84, he almost sang. <laughs> oh, excuse me, the motorbike here. There you I, go. Kevin's voice is a cross between Van Morrison and I would say Jagger. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. What That's kind of like instrument? Kind of what happens when you let Irish kids sing the blues? What kind of <laughs> instruments do you play, Stefan? What's that? What kind of instruments do you play? Oh, uh, I, I play guitar. I play a lot of slide guitar and a lot of open tunings and stuff. But I, like, uh, I play whatever I need to play to get the tracks done. I've got some that are band ever, tracks where. Do you ever hook I up with everything uh, on them? Do you ever hook up with Michael J. Fox on that? Because I understand he likes that, you too. You know, when, uh, we fooled around a little bit when we were doing the picture, and then years later we ran into each other in L.A., and we talked about it, and we just didn't. It just didn't ever happen. He was too busy. I was too busy. We were in different parts of the world, you know. Yeah. Well, Claire, you sing, do you? Uh, a little. I can carry a tune. <laughs> yeah, right. I can carry a tune. <laughs> <laughs> Just the you know, most to be incredible a, voice. Yeah. To be in musical theater, they they make you sing. Yeah. So I had to learn how to sing. Yeah, years back. Do, uh, do you? I do. I I can sing a little. Oh, yeah. You, know, you say you've done uh, mu- musical theater and stuff musical like. Musical theater. Mm-hmm. You, That's the, you know, if you live in New York and you're in the theater, you have to do musical theater or you do plays. Do you That's have a favorite play. musical? That I, that I, well, I no, it's just movie musical. Any movie, movie, movie music? musical? Yeah. Besides class of 1984? Ah, <laughs> oh, movie musical. I'm going to have to go back to the originals. Yeah. The old standards that my parents made me sit in front of the TV and watch, and then all of a sudden I realized I liked them. I love the old stuff. I love the gypsies and the flower drum song and all the old stuff. Singing in the rain. A lot of Andrew Lloyd Webber stuff. So we're talking yeah. about that kind of voice. Okay. You know. <laughs> yeah, I, I like sort of a Phantom of the Opera. You know, Love Never Dies kind of that that kind of voice. Okay. Mm. Well, meet my agent, please. He's on the other <laughs> extension here. <laughs> and I what? can sing a little, yeah. Yeah. So it'll be fun to do something with Stefan, something original. Yeah. Even if it's not original, I said we should just record something like Mockingbird or something for fun. There you, you know, go. I get a kick out of it. There you I go. People would get a kick out of it. Oh, we will. <laughs> and, and, and and you could bring Jenny Wright in. She can sing the wall. <laughs> <laughs> just don't throw any uh, wine bottles at her. There you go. No, <laughs> no, no violence. <laughs> What's this I saw on Facebook, Stefan? You somewhere signing a bra. Com- ex- yeah, ex- that would be on my page. <laughs> you know, on, on my cover shot in the back of it. You want to tell that I story? Was in a, I, well, I don't even know the whole story. I was, I was at ChillerCon, <laughs> yeah. and I'm sitting at the table, and I'm signing, you know, normal things like pictures and stuff. <laughs> And and uh, and and Claire came over to me. You came over to me, right? Uh, we were both sitting there, and a girl came up to me, and she said, "Sorry to take your story away, but no, I won't. I, I won't know. be longer." <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> she came up to me, and she says, "Do you mind if Stefan signed my bra?" <laughs> I said, "Absolutely not, as long as you're not in it." So I thought she was just going to go and whip it out, you know, and just like do one of those flash dance moments where she yeah. just rips under her shirt. Well, she she goes in her bag and she pulls out something and she says, "This is for charity." Okay. So the whole thing had a decidedly, you know, spin a little bit different there. So that's what it was. It was a charity. Oh, I see. So it was a charity, charity. bra. It wasn't actually. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know. I just I was uh, Claire handed it to me and like I was like, "What?" Okay, you know, and <laughs> that made it great for a great photo. I yeah. just had this image of Stefan, like, hey, anybody want any Claire's clothes? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I know. Well, if you look at the bra, that wouldn't I'll have sign been them first. Yeah. <laughs> Haven't gotten that bad yet. Signing off our clothes. Do you, do you do many uh, conventions, Stefan? I don't do a lot, um, but yeah, I mean, in the past few years, again, you know, that's kind of a thing that took some time for me. Um, you know, uh, I like I said, you know, I, I'm as guilty as anybody else. You know, you get, it's, it's, I didn't want to, you know, capitalize on that. I was really more interested in what I was doing now, which I still am. I'm always more interested in what's happening today than what happened, like, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago or something like that. But, you know, I, I've learned to appreciate both. But, uh, um 
Yeah, it just... Um, yeah? Yeah, you know, you just, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> you, went, you went blank. Yeah, I just went blank. What did you just ask me? <laughs> I was asking you know? about the conventions, but uh, we, we know, I think the closest convention... I think it's time to feed the beast. Yeah, I need to eat. What you ask? I'm getting a light blood sugar here. Yeah, What'd same here. I was going to say, the, the closest convention we have here is in oh, Halifax, yeah. and... Uh, and we don't have conventions here, and I, I wish we had something like that. But um, you know, what's amazing is it's 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 really turned into a cottage industry. I mean, it's quite astounding. We got a list from uh, uh, I have a, a rep uh, who uh, is handling you know conventions and stuff, and she sent uh, us a link on all this stuff. I mean, they're just everywhere. We did one in Delaware just recently, mm-hmm. and there were like three that weekend in Delaware. You know, and and. Uh, and they're all over the place. So, you know, you might want to check around because there's a whole listing of them in, in Canada we got. And mostly, of course, in like places in Montreal and so on and so on and so on. But uh, check around because I'll tell you, they're popping up everywhere. Yeah, we need to get them here. We need to get New Brunswick on the map. I'm I'm working hard to get New Brunswick on the map here. And not New Jersey, yeah. New Brunswick, but the one here in the Canada. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and and what's what's kind of a shame, I think, about the, some of the conventions that I have been to in in Canada, is is that, um, again, this kind of problem with, that I've run into with you know the Canadian industry, I don't see a whole lot of Canadians being represented there. Exactly. You know, I just see a lot of Americans from American TV shows signing autographs, and you know, when I went to the Vancouver Film Festival VIF uh, just a few years ago. I met some people who were just so knocked out that I was there. They were like, wow, a Canadian. (laughs) I'm like, yeah, what's the problem? But there weren't any. Wow. (laughs) I was like, okay. (laughs) Yeah, that... I know it's when I, I, I it's kind of a, a friend of mine actually on Class of eighty four, an art director on Class of eighty four, said to me once, said to me, if Canada were a person, it'd be an egomaniac with an inferiority complex. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. That's that's it. No, I would like to see that because I'm. I know when I interviewed, I've done some interviews, especially even with uh, American and UK actors. Who I said. Yeah. We, ha- we haven't done a signing in Canada. Can you arrange something? And I'm kind of powerless, you know? Yeah. I mean, I'm lucky to be... Funny, yeah, I'm lucky to we be doing... should do- start one. I wish I could. I don't I know the first thing about doing that. And it- well, I don't think anybody does. <laughs> <laughs> but you get a hotel, you get a bunch of celebrities, that ain't hard, and you get... <laughs> come in and, uh, you know, they keep what they sign and you keep the door. Yeah, <laughs> it sounds like that's not a bad business. <laughs> yeah. you'd, be you'd be good at that, I bet. Yeah, I could do a a thirty fifth anniversary of class of nineteen eighty four. Yeah, go. I think they should do that here, considering the promoting well, I've so. done. <laughs> I think so. Yeah, yeah. You know, I like I said, I know I said this twice before, but I don't think anybody's promoted that film like I have here. Well, I can't think of anyone. Yeah. But I think we got to get you out of Brunswick if you haven't had, you know, much uh, mobility there. Were you well, born there? Are yeah, we I've been here. Are you I've born been there. Yeah, I'll be forty-five in July, and um, mm-hmm. yeah, I've been here my whole life. It's kind of hard to move around right now because uh, both my parents aren't at the best of health. Oh, oh yeah, I know what that's like. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, and. Um, I, I work at, like, I don't work here where I'm at. I volunteer here. But right. at mm-hmm. the job I'm at is a family business. And if I took any time off, yeah. that job's not going to get done, you know? Sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because my father's not capable of doing it right now. And uh, yeah, right. Mm-hmm. I can. Right. Yeah. Okay. So it's kind of hard for me to uh, move around. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. And well, you're getting around pretty well, good for not actually moving. <laughs> yeah. You're doing all right. Well, look Ladies at the... and gentlemen, I'd like to thank our guest, Greg Gilbert. <laughs> 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 well, you know what? I can't believe that I've been able to talk to the amount of people I've been able to talk to on this, this program. I mean, fun, huh? it is fun. Yeah. It is fun, you know. It, and also... it flies by, I'm sure, for you. 
oh, it's a lot of fun. And I'm like, I, I saw a class of 1984 when I was like a teen. I had no idea I was going to be talking to you and to Lisa and to Mary and Gord Lewis, you know, and hopefully Aaron well, Noble. Difference, uh, we had no idea either. No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was saying to Stefan the other day, I said, um, I, who, we were watching an old rerun of Land of the Giants. Mm-hmm. And I said, you know, all those t- nights where I sat there with my brother watching that show, did you ever think that I'd be dating one of the guys <laughs> with the dog? <laughs> oh, you dated the dog? <laughs> No, that, that, that dog is just doing fine. Everyone wants to know about Chipper. He's fine. <laughs> Stephen, you but, mentioned... Oh, what, what you saying? No, I was just going to say, you never know what's going to happen. And this is no way to know. No. Decades later, I mean, you know, passes cross. Yeah. So. Stephen, have you heard any of my other interviews? I know you've subscribed yeah. to me, mm-hmm. I believe, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Whenever, um, yeah, I, I generally, when I see him posted around... I listen to him. Yep. Which ones have you listened to? with his mouth full because his yeah, blood sugar is dropping. I, I went and got him some cottage cheese, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Drug store eats cottage cheese. Cottage yes. cheese. Is there any interviews that uh, that you want to point out that you've listened to? Oh, gee. No, I have to <laughs> listen to more. Put you on the spot. Well, I'll put to you on the spot. More to, to be able to make that kind of assertion. I'm not real good at favorites anyway because I always like individual things for what they are. Yeah. So I'm not big on comparing. It's like, oh, that's really cool, that conversation with that person. Oh, that's really cool, that conversation with that person. So I I wouldn't, nothing comes to mind that I single out as being like, you know, wow. But I I think you're great. I think you're a great interview. Um, There's no doubt about it. I mean, I have a lot of fun talking to you. It's real easy. And and from what I've heard from everybody else, it's the same kind of thing. Who have you heard from? Oh, Harrison Ford, Sally Field. <laughs> oh, gee, and I haven't even talked to them. Well, wow. They're still talking about you. <laughs> yeah, you know. Just a few things I've managed to pull up. I've always, you know, it's always very pleasant. Oh, yeah. Well, I enjoy doing it. I'll, I'll say that. And it's kind of nice uh, digging yeah. these movies up and, and uh, highlighting them and um, having a nice chat with people and highlighting their careers you know that's very cool it's very cool it's very cool your approach on it too you know because it's it's you know you got some depth to it well i try to keep out of people's personal lives i don't like the tabloids and i don't right. read them either i i just don't care you know mm. yeah i i well they often have little if anything to do with the work which is you know what we're talking about so well, I like the Midnight Crowd and the Comic-Con type crowd. Those are people yeah. that really love their movies, you know? Yeah, right. And I kind of want that audience. I don't, yeah. yeah, I don't care who's in a relationship with who or, or whatever, <laughs> yeah. you know? That just, I just don't care about it, you know? Yeah, no, I know what you mean. Yeah. That's the thing with Facebook. Sometimes you see people <laughs> posting their foods, what they had to eat. So <laughs> Stefan got... What they happened, their trip to the dentist. Steph, you know, is, is, taking the dog to the vet. Is Stefan going to post know, a picture yeah, of cottage gets, cheese? When gets, okay. When it comes right down to it and it gets personal, yeah. it doesn't matter who you're talking to. It's, it's all pretty much the same. <laughs> <laughs> so, Stefan, you know, you... Everybody has to go to the dentist and the bathroom and, you know, <laughs> things like that. <laughs> Stefan's going to post a picture of cottage cheese. <laughs> no. You know, I... I, I I could, Stephen's blood sugar was dropping. I threw it right underneath him. And that's what happened. I could have said he was, you know, having like, you know, a beer and chips or something. But nah, I don't post pictures of food unless I'm getting a percentage. <laughs> <laughs> well, He's a great you cook. did you know that Stephen's a great cook? Oh yeah. Well, I saw him cooking up stuff. Well, he definitely cooked in class of 1984. <laughs> <laughs> well. There you go. You, you got lit right on fire. Of, actually, we had a couple of good dinners on that movie. I remember we had a couple of times we, we, because uh, we had a lot of local crew in Toronto, so sometimes we wind up like, you know, over at somebody's house and make dinner and stuff like that. Well, we did that a couple of times, me and Perry and uh, Neil and Keith and Lisa and a bunch of people. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> a couple of, just a couple of times, but it was fun. Yeah. Well, you know what? We're last time I spoke to you, 
We, I had you on for two hours, and we're bearing down on that again today. Oh, my goodness. Did we just talk for two hours? Two hours, yeah. Yeah. I had, Lisa oh. Lang was is still my longest. I had her on here for two hours. Well, that's because yeah. you had a crush on her. Yeah. There you go. Well, she's, I've, I've she's had... She's a good person to talk to, too. She's got great stories. Oh, I've had a few two-hour interviews on here, you know, so... Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. We're going to well, go back cool. and well, check feel, you out now. Feel free to cut it if you, you know, I mean, because, you know, if it, if it isn't interesting for two hours... Yeah, you can cut out the co- you can cut out the cottage cheese bit. That's oh sure. no, I I only cut if I have to. I had one actor give out his email address twice in the interview, and oh, I knew no. I knew I had to go back and cut that. But yeah, right. Yeah. Generally, I like it to be as authentic as possible. So, yeah. Right. But we're celebrating the 35th anniversary of Class of 1984. One of I, in my opinion, one of Canada's finest. And um, <laughs> yeah, gotta get the rest of the cast to check out my show and get their butts on here. I, I don't bite as long as far as they know. <laughs> but, well, I'll do what I can. Yeah, but sounds um, like a challenge, Steph. And uh, of course, Stefan, you and Claire and Jenny gotta do the doubt for our challenge. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm gonna hopefully get Jenny back on here uh, momentarily whenever I connect with her again. I know Excellent. I got her on Facebook. And of course, Excellent. yeah. And of course, we're also celebrating you and Claire being just this <laughs> cool couple. Well, thank well, you. Well, you know, it's a lot of work, but someone has <laughs> to definitely pass the torch. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Greg, for asking me to be on. I was I wanted to have you to come come on. You know, I really loved thank your you uh, modeling pics. Yeah. I thought it would be cool to celebrate this film, and I, I just wanted to have you two come on together to get a feel about what the two of you were like, you know, and yeah. we had now that you, And now right. that you know, you can't tell anybody. I won't tell nobody. Okay. <laughs> Except okay. when this airs. <laughs> Although this that does go out. Going out to <laughs> all the fans. <laughs> all the fans. Well, I don't know when this is going to go out. It'll be some six months or so, so just be patient on that. Sure. Yeah. No problem. You let us know. Yeah. And uh, before you go, I was wondering if I could get the two of you to do a plug for my show. Yeah, absolutely. We need certainly. Just just say your names, and of course, uh, say you're listening to Python's Paradise with Greg Gilbert in New Brunswick, Canada. Alrighty. You ready? Yep. Shoot. Claire Deming and Stefan Arngrim listening to Python's Paradise in New Brunswick, Canada. Absolutely. Or else. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> he likes snakes and we'll find you <laughs> there we go well you know what it was an honor having you two back on here and uh you know never know maybe sometime down the future I'll, we'll do a trilogy you know <laughs> there we go yeah absolutely greg anytime oh i enjoyed Always this a pleasure it's it's been great and um thank you we'll see you on the internet yeah yeah, maybe even tonight. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> Thank you very much, Greg. Yes, absolutely. God bless both of you. Bless you too. Yeah, you too. Take care, Greg. Thanks for listening, everybody. Absolutely. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs>